my principle of practice, unless contraindicated, patients should receive thromboprophylaxis in intensive care unit. I'm very, very clear about that. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that should be the way to go forward. And I will try and justify this in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the way uh, the, the evidence is currently, you can see that uh, in patients who have fatal thromboprophylaxis, around 75% of them are medically ill hospitalized patients. The, the patients who are critically ill tend to have a two times higher risk of venous thromboembolism, and they have got a 33% higher incidence as compared to the other population. And only one third of critically ill patients are suspected to have clinical uh, pulmonary embolism based on autopsy studies. And we know that unfortunately, patients who have uh, venous thromboembolism in ICU tend to have longer ventilation, longer ICU stay, and obviously the mortality increases. Now, what's the most important thing? The thing in the red out there is basically talks about the preventable cause of death. And one of the most important preventable cause of death in critically ill patients is VTE. If we can prevent that, I think we are doing a big favor to our, our patients and we should be doing this on a consistent way. Now, COVID brought in a plethora of uh, evidence and plethora of uh, papers. Not all of them were of good quality, but it screamed of thromboembolism because uh, we sort of agreed upon to the fact that there is a vasculitis of the, of the whole system because of the COVID virus and, and heparin came and, and heparin and low molecular weight uh, heparin came into the womb because everybody wanted to sort of give it and we probably overdid it as well. So I'm not going to go into the details of that, but what we overall realize is that if you have, uh, if you have to compare the rates, it was almost 10% higher incidence of venous thromboembolism, which has been reported in the various studies as compared to the other population in the hospital or on the OPD basis, which includes pulmonary embolism. So I think we, we should be very clear that this is a disease which is not just seen um, uh, in, in textbooks, but it actually happens in the real life as well. I'm just going to go from, uh, from the little evidence which we talked about to talk about a hypothetical case and then go on to see whether the Indian patients have got a similar sort of a incidence of thromboembolism or not. This is a 75-year-old gentleman who's got more than 10 days of abdominal pain. On physical exam, he's uh, got a hemoglobin of nine. He's mildly tachycardic. He's got mild fever, 37.5 degrees centigrade. Tenderness in the left iliac fossa hypogastrium. Essentially, he's been diagnosed to have severe ulcerative colitis and patient was initiated on IV cyclosporin and parental nutrition and rehydration. Now, we say that the risk is high for this gentleman to have a, a thromboembolism, so they should be giving a preventive dose of, uh, of for VTE. And why do we base that on? We base that on some of the scoring systems. The, you know this uh, power scoring system, which basically uh, gives you a number, and the risk assessment is done on these points, their active cancer, is there a previous history of VTE? Uh, is the patient having reduced mobility? Is there a known thrombophilic condition, recent history of surgery or trauma, elderly gentlemen, heart or respiratory failure, myocardial infarction, obesity, acute infection, and ongoing hormonal treatment. And a risk of less than four, sorry, a score of less than four, stratifies you into a lower risk category as opposed to a score of greater than five, four puts you up into a higher risk strategy. And if you look at the literature again, you would realize that the highest incidence of VTE in hospitalized patients is seen in patients who have got infection. So I think patients who are infected, typically the patients who are in medical ICU, typically who are admitted in the wards, unless contraindicated, again, I would re-emphasize my word that we essentially should be giving them thromboprophylaxis. Let's look at some of the Indian data. So this is an endorse uh, sub-study which was basically done. And this was looking at surgical wards and medical wards. And you could see there were around 680 patients in surgical, 400 odd patients in medical wards. The red column denotes patients who got uh, the thromboembolism prophylaxis, and the gray column denotes uh, patients who got ACCP recommended thromboprophylaxis. What is woefully concerning is that this was 10 years ago that only 17.5% of people actually got thromboprophylaxis, whereas the world average at that time was around 50%. So we were really lacking, even 10 years behind, uh, if we look at, we were really lacking into that. What about PGI Chandigarh? They looked at the incidence of uh, pulmonary embolism among adult uh, medical patients, and they found it to be almost 15.9%, almost 16%. And once you had a thromboembolism, 
the risk of dying was near to 80%. So that's, a, that's again, a very, very high uh, risk population, which is going to have a mortality if it was not prevented. So I think this is, again, sort of guiding us towards the fact that we have a patient who could have a preventable death, and we should be doing everything in, in, in our control of, of preventing that. that. CMC Velour, similar story. Incidence of VTE around 17 and a half per thousand admissions, and uh, the spread of patients seems to be across general surgery, orthopedic, obstetrics, neurosurgery, and others. Others would be majority of them would be medical patients. And what they did was they saw so this study again around 10 years ago, where sort of published this data very nicely, and they showed that uh, the distribution of uh, venous thromboembolism kept on increasing from their observation. Once they realized it, they saw that the use of low molecular weight heparin also started to go up and the incidence of thromboembolism started to come down. So I think that's a very, very nice way of depicting that as you would use the prophylaxis more and more, the incidence of DVT as well as, VT, as, well as pulmonary embolism started to come down. AIMS again showing a significant amount of uh, uh, similarity in terms of the data presented there. 75% of the patients admitted to medicine and ICU at the highest risk for DVT and PE, and only 12.5% got prophylaxis within the first two days of admission. That's, again, woefully short of what we would want. We would want all the patients to be reassessed for the risk of bleeding, and if none, then they should be given a thromboprophylaxis. Our friend from Chennai, Naresh Ramakrishnan, did a very uh, interesting uh, study, a registry. He sort of uh, came out with a registry called as DETECT, 275 odd patients, uh, whether there was medical thromboprophylaxis given or not. And only half of them, around uh, 45 per 44% of them, sort of received uh, thromboprophylaxis. 55% did not receive any thromboprophylaxis. And the majority patients, which was almost 85% of them, seemed to receive a form of low molecular weight heparin as opposed to unfractionated heparin or fondoperinox. So, they further went across and looked at the incidence of DVT. Obviously, the column on the right here, the blue and the red, shows that people who did not develop their DVT because almost 50 to 45% had no thromboprophylaxis given. But those who developed DVT had no thromboprophylaxis given. So those who were having thromboprophylaxis did not have any incidence of DVT. Again, I think this study sort of points us towards the same direction that this is a preventable complication. Chances that your patient is going to land up with a DVT is very, very low. <clears throat> now, why am, I, why am I sort of being a bit passionate about it and shouting it at the, at the top of my voice? The reason is that intensive care patients have got twofold the risk categories. One is a general risk for thromboembolism, which is there with every other patient, whether it's surgical or medical. Uh, which is age, past history, cancer, immobilization, obesity, pregnancy, trauma, and so on. But ICU, these patients tend to have sepsis, which has come out to be the single most important factor in development of, uh, of thromboembolism. Respiratory or cardiac failure. On top of that, there's a high use of vasopressors to kind of keep, this, keep their hemodynamics uh, in, a, in a normal range. We tend to use a lot of pharmacological sedation to facilitate mechanical ventilation we have devices such as central line dialysis catheters been pushed, put into the veins and arterial lines been put into the arteries where we actually start giving injury. Physically, we start having induced uh, <clears throat> chances of thromboprophylaxis, thromboembolism there. And I think these are the risks which are especially important to be, un to be understood. And hence, ICU patients among the all patients actually form a very special category where, again, the risk for thromboembolism becomes very, very high. So I think uh, we, we, we sort of uh, should be looking at that in a very uh, careful manner. Now, amongst the options available for us, which is the one which you can use? Or rather, this slide actually talks about which one you should not be using. And the only, only one which we should not be using right now, uh, which has not been proven and probably plays a very small role, is the direct acting oral, for anti oral anticoagulants. You can use low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin, or fundoperinox. I think all three are fine. There is absolutely no problem with that. If you compare the three, we know this. I'm just going to skip through this very, very quickly. Heparin, very cheap. It's got an antidote. 
uh, however you know there is uh, there are there are problems with that it requires a serial checks and adjustments and sometimes the bleeding risk can be a bit high and obviously the hit percentage is around 3 to 5% whereas low molecular weight heparin usually it's a once or a twice a day dose depending on whether you're using it for prophylaxis or for or for treatment and uh, unfortunately does not have any antidote as such it's for a partial antidote uh, the good thing is that the hit incidence is very very low it does have a problem with the renal impairment uh, especially enoxaparin so you need to do a sub dose adjustment uh, fundoperinox again i think uh, again no dose no antidote available and it bus basically does have again concerns about uh, renal impairment but much lesser than enoxaparin uh, I'm going to skip out these doses. So the doses are pretty standard. Uh, the idea is not to give you uh, a boring lecture about what doses to be used when, but to tell you and emphasize to you that it is important to consider thromboprophylaxis in the critically ill patients. What do the guidelines say? The ACCP, the physicians say that, look, um, low molecular weight heparin, thromboprophylaxis is recommended over no prophylaxis. Uh, high at patients who are at high risk for major bleeding or who are bleeding, Use mechanical thromboprophylaxis evidence is 2C. And when the risk decreases, you should fall back on the pharmacological thromboprophylaxis. The hematologists say that for pharmacological thromboprophylaxis is suggested over the mechanical thromboprophylaxis and obviously use low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And consider using low molecular consider using low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin is what preferably they would want you to do. Why is that? Why is uh, low molecular weight heparin a little bit favored as opposed to uh, unfractionated heparin? You look at this study here, it talks about, uh, it talks about four or five uh, different aspects which we looked into the uh, in form of outcomes, mortality, pulmonary embolism, symptomatic proximal DVT, major bleeding, and HIT. Obviously, none of them except HIT had a very, very uh, good relative uh, risk reduction, uh, but all of them were in the favor of low molecular weight heparin, whatever little relative risk reduction was seen. So it's not a very high quality evidence, but we are seeing that the evidence seems to be of moderate or low quality, but they all tend to favor the low, low molecular weight heparin. So low molecular weight heparin probably in critically ill patients is the better idea. This again looked at uh, three or four studies, the PRINCE study, the PRIME, the Hill bomb, and the PREVAIL, and the relative risk reduction was anywhere between 19% to 86%. But again, if you look at uh, the number of patients, around two, 400 odd patients, 200 in each group in the PRINCE trial, the other one had around 400 odd patients, 70 odd patients, and 600 odd patients. But again, all of them, this, this slide actually shows the incidence of VTE. So the, the one in the orange is unfractionated, and the one in the blue is low molecular weight heparin. And you can see that the incidence of VTE was much higher in the unfractionated heparin group when compared to the uh, low molecular weight heparin. Again, there is some data which is emerged out in terms of mortality, not very high quality data, but when you do a meta-analysis of all of these studies, you tend to realize that uh, there's a reduction in Apache 2 score. Now, reduction in Apache 2 score really doesn't mean anything from in terms of intensive care unit. Uh, in terms of my outcomes, I look at Apache 2 score at the first 24 hours, and then that sort of stratifies my risk of death. Whether the score improves or not, I don't think it depends just on low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, but nevertheless, this is what they looked at. Mortality, definitely. The, so they sort of uh, could say that it was favoring low molecular weight heparin at 28 days. And obviously, the length of stay in the hospital or in the ICU decreased as well. I believe that out of these three, if you can actually make a difference on the mortality, a dent on the mortality, I think that's where we should be actually uh, concentrating all our efforts. The three big trials, Mednox, Prevent, and Artemis, Again, consider uh, compared to a placebo with a low molecular weight heparin in the first two and fundoparinox in the third study and found a relative risk reduction of around 50%, just around that, that mark. So I think thromboprophylaxis certainly prevents VTE events in hospitalized medical patients and more so in the ICU patients. I think there is convincing data for that. Most of the guidelines which you look at, the, the guidelines which you could pick up and if you could just scroll through them, they all would emphasize that thromboprophylaxis has to be given in high in selected high risk patients. And these are all guidelines in the last two to three years. There is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind that medical patients and ICU patients are a high risk category based on the scoring systems and they require to be given, given this. This was the last one of the last papers which I'm going to just show you the action trial which came across in COVID 19. 
Again, uh, they did not find the mortality uh, be benefit, but the wind ratio is what they looked at was around 0.86. So I think again, evidence from uh, from thromboprophylaxis from um, COVID also seems to sort of creep up, and our practice should change for good now. We should be looking at thromboprophylaxis more widely than what we have been up until now. So now I started off by saying that unless contraindicated use thromboprophylaxis, what are the contraindications? I think a common sense approach needs to prevail. If you have active bleeding, platelet count is less than 20,000, if there's an impending surgery, then obviously this is an absolute contraindication right now. Impen impending surgery immediately, then these are absolute contraindications. And uh, if they are contraindications, then please consider mechanical calf compression devices, which can be used until your contraindications become a little soft. And then you can probably think of, uh, of uh, using pharmacological anticoagulation. I would is the most common preventable cause of mortality. Uh, VT risk combines both general as well as specific ICU risk factors in critically ill patients. Low molecular weight heparin seems to be better than unfractionated heparin. And uh, obviously, when you have a higher VT risk, you seem to be basically associating with higher mortality and morbidity. And that has been seen in COVID patients as well. Most of guidelines would recommend you to use um, a thromboprophylaxis and prefer low molecular weight over unfractionated. And I think within 24 hours of hospitalization, you should be doing a risk assessment and thinking whether you're going to anticoagulate your patients or not.